Welcome to Know Alive Alaska. My name is Lisa Hiruki Rearing, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is a collaborative effort by NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center, where I work, NOAA's Alaska Regional Collaboration Network, and NOAA's National Weather Service. This is the eighth webinar in a series that we designed to help you get to know NOAA's work in Alaska and how we connect and work with your communities. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, studies the ocean and the atmosphere and where the two meet, from the weather to the ocean to the animals that live around us. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA or work in partnership with NOAA. We hope this gives you a sneak peek at different career paths that you might be interested in. Today, we're introducing you to Katie Sweeney. She works in the Marine Mammal Lab, which is part of NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Seattle, Washington, where I also work. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in research and stewardship, we want to recognize that we're all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that Katie's work is done in the Aleutian Island chain and in the Pribilof Islands. These areas are the traditional lands and waters, waters of the Nunga, translated to the people of the sea, who have stewarded their lands and waters for thousands of years. We'd also like to acknowledge that Katie is presenting from, and we're hosting this webinar from, the traditional lands of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speaker. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure everyone can hear our speaker. However, there's a box where you can write in questions and I see you guys have been writing in your names and where you're coming from, so that's great. We encourage you to ask questions as we go and I'll be keeping track for Katie. She'll stop every now and again and answer a few questions. We might not get to all of our questions because we have a lot of people on the line, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. All right, I'll stop here and I'll hand it over to Katie to introduce herself. Great, thank you, Lisa. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm so excited to talk to you today about drones, scat, and the joy of marine mammal field work in Alaska. Before we dive in, I wanted to share a bit about my journey to become a marine biologist. Ever since I, little, I was little, I would proclaim that I wanted to be a marine biologist and seemed to just never grow out of it. I think a lot of this was owed to my time spent outdoors during my childhood. I was lucky to live near creeks where I could see salmon swimming up the stream in the fall and near, um, <clears throat> excuse me, near watersheds where there were a lot of little critters and I could play in the muck. My family and I did a lot of camping, fishing, and hiking, and we even got to go to Hawaii, where I became absolutely obsessed with the ocean and with snorkeling. I think a lot of this exposure made me really fall in love with nature and want to be a part of protecting the environment. I went to, the undergrad, I went to undergrad at University of Washington, where I majored in aquatic and fishery sciences. While I was at the University of Washington, I was able to intern and volunteer at NOAA. While I was there, I was able to build some connections and learn a lot of new experiences and skills. About a year after graduating, I was hired to work at NOAA in 2007. During my time of working at NOAA, I was able to get away to go to North Carolina to go to Duke University, where I earned my Master's of Environmental Management. You might be wondering what the favorite part of my job is, and it's definitely going up to Alaska to go do field work. I just love to be close to the animals and be able to get the data that we need to fulfill our goals. I, the other thing that I love about being a scientist is continuous learning. We're always trying to solve new problems, whether it's how can we survey this population or, oh no, there's something wrong, how can we help? I'm a part of the Marine Mammal Lab here in the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, and we study marine mammals in Alaska State. As you, you can see where the red star is, that's where I'm stationed currently. There are several different programs in the Marine Mammal Lab, and I'm in the Alaska Ecosystem Program. But first, you might wonder, why do we study marine mammals? Well, it's part of NOAA's mission. It's our mission to study marine mammal, mammals and other protected resources along with the ecosystem. It's important to have a healthy ecosystem to have sustainable fisheries so that we can feed people. Marine mammals are also really important because they are an indicator species for ecosystem health. This means that if we see something wrong happening with marine mammals, it's probably a big hint that there's something else happening in that ecosystem. Marine mammals are also really important to understand because there's potential for them to interact with human activities like fisheries or construction or boating or recreation. So it's important for us to understand all aspects of these populations and human behavior so we can mitigate those impacts. 
Marine mammals are also really important for subsistence and cultural importance for very for many Alaska Native communities throughout Alaska. I'm a part of the Alaska Ecosystem Program, and in our program, we study pinnipeds. So Lisa, I'm wondering if we can ask our viewers if they can type into the box, if they can tell us either their guess for what they think pinniped means, or if they know one of the three groups that includes pinnipeds. So for those of you guys who are on the line watching right now, um, if you can type into your question box what you think the word pinnipeds refers to. And okay, so we're getting some answers right away. Um, Emma is wondering whether it means small creatures. Leah thinks it's penguins. Colleen, oh, Statler thinks that it's marine mammals. Um, Michelle thinks it's seals. Megan thinks that it means that it swims. Um, and we have a couple people, Chris and Patricia, think that it's seals and sea lions. Megan also says that it might be a whale. Um, Carol says that it, that it has webbed hands and feet. And mm -hmm. another guess, Christina was saying maybe it's carnivorous marine mammals. And um, Annabelle is saying that it's minipeds. We're not sure what minipeds are, but maybe you can help us out. Well, those are all really great guesses. And Carol was right. Pinnipeds means flipper-footed. And pinnipeds is a fancy scientific word for three groups of animals, seals, sea lions, and walrus. Now, walrus are kind of their own species and they're all the only one in their group. So it's pretty easy to distinguish a walrus from seals and sea lions, I would say. You have those big tusks and walrus are huge. They can get up to 4,000 pounds. So I'm gonna talk a bit more about how to tell the difference between seals and sea lions because these are two different groups of animals. So we wanna make sure we're using the right words when we describe them. So phocids is another fancy scientific term for the word seal, for seals. And these are the true seals. And you can already see by their body shape, they're all very similar, kind of torpedo shaped. Whereas otoriids, which is the fancy scientific name for sea lions and fur seals, are the eared seals. And you can see that their body shape is vastly different than seals. One of the biggest differences that you can see just by looking at them is their ear hole. You can see this seal on the left, it has eyes, a nose, and then there's that hole right there. This hole is their ear, and you can tell they have no external ear flap like we do, but you can see this first seal on the right. He has these cute little ears hanging out, kind of like Baby Yoda, <laughs> and so that's a very big distinction that you can make. <clears throat> do you guys know of any other differences between seals and sea lions? Okay, so if you can type into your box what you think some of the differences between seals and sea lions are. Um, let's see. So we don't have any guesses so far, but I'm wondering if it if some of it has to do with body shape. Oh, here, here come some um, some guesses. We have um, Nadia says size. Leah mm -hmm. says that there are different names. Karen says that there's a long versus short neck. We're not sure which one has the long and which one has the short neck. Um, Chris says that the flippers on sea lions are bigger, and Megan says the body shape is different. Oh, and Patricia says that sea lions walk on their flippers, and so in fact Chris says that as well. Yes, that's exactly right. Sea lions walk on their flippers, and seals tend to not. So now I have a cool video to actually show you with the different ways that they move. So here you can see these are harbor seals on land. Harbor seals like to live really close to the water, which is probably because it takes them a little while to get around on land. They do that nice inchworming look. And here you can see these are northern fur seals or otoriids. Otoriids <laughs> tend to are able to rotate their flippers forward and tend to walk on all fours without having much of their body contacting the ground. You can also see that sea lions can actually be pretty quick on the ground, but both seals and sea lions are very good swimmers. Harbor seals use their front shorter flippers to kind of maneuver around. And then you can see when they really want to get going, they use their back flippers and do this kind of undulating side to side motion. 
Whereas fur seals have these long front flippers that they use mostly to propel themselves forward. So we're seeing that the, a lot of the folks who, who wrote in after you started the video were saying that, um, that uh, seals have fur and sea lions are sleeker. So that, it looked like that might, might have been the case as well um, in that video. Definitely. I just want to make sure, Lisa, can you see my screen now? I cannot see your screen yet. I think you have to share your screen from the menu. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is tricky. I got it. <laughs> All right, I, I want to just pause here and maybe ask, wait and see if you guys have any questions to type in. If not, we can keep going, but I want to pause and give you guys a minute to ask some questions. We have a couple of questions on here. First of all, I did want to give a shout out to Joshua, whose video wasn't showing up. If you're having trouble with the, the video not showing up, try to get out of the webinar and then back in, and that might, that might solve the problem. Sometimes it has to do with Wi-Fi. Um, so Patricia was asking, what is the term for a seal to terrestrial locomotion? So what, what is it called when seals are moving on land? Oh, so when seals are moving on land, we call that the lumping. <laughs> but you can, I also like to say it's kind of like inchworming, like an inchworm, because a lot of people know what that means. <laughs> and Christina is, is wondering, which are more playful, seals or sea lions? Oh, that's a tricky question. I, I think it might be both, but I think the common thing is, is that all younger animals tend to be a lot more curious, especially if you're a scuba diver. And then from, from um, Ms. Colton-Born's class, um, Nina was asking, why do they call them fur seals? Yes, they call them fur seals. Well, calling them seals is kind of a misnomer. It's not, it's not totally accurate because they are technically an otoriot or a sea lion species, but they call them fur seals because they have such thick fur and that thick fur they really use to keep them warm. And you'll notice that fur seals are, are maybe a little bit more skinny than you'll see with stellar sea lions or with other seal or phocid species where the, who have those big kind of torpedo round bodies. And then um, Statler was asking, how fast do seals, sea lions, and fur seals swim? Ooh, that's a great question. I don't actually know the answer to that question, but if you can reach out to Lisa with your email, I'm sure I can find the answer and follow up with you. I also think that that might be something that we might, you might be able to find by looking it up on the internet if you Google how fast do seals swim, and, and then you could compare between different types of seals, because I think some seals can swim pretty quickly. Yeah, that's a good point. And then um, let's see, Clara is, is oh wait, Trayson is asking, what is your favorite type of seal? My favorite type of seal, I think would have to be elephant seals. They're really big and they just have, they just seem to have really interesting personalities. But my favorite sea lion species is the stellar sea lion because those are what I started studying first. <laughs> And there's there are a couple of questions that I know that you're going to get onto. So you're going to be talking about how big do seals and sea lions get. Um, but one last question before we move on. Emma was wondering whether seals get along with sea lions. Yes, they do. Seals and sea lions can kind of hang out around each other and they usually don't bother each other very much, but they don't generally swim with each other or in groups with each other. All right, well, maybe we should get along to the next section because I know that you're going to be answering some of the questions that have been asked here and um, we're looking forward to it. Excellent, thank you, Lisa. All right, so I am in the Alaska Ecosystem Program and we study two different species of otoriads or sea lions. We study the stellar sea lion and the northern fur seal. I'm kind of curious if you guys have any ideas for what it is we study specifically for these animals. And a big hint is gonna be that it's probably things that you do every day. Can you okay, type so Leah is wondering, Leah is saying, um, actually Leah and um, Pascal were saying that maybe you, what, you study poop 
and that might be from the title of your talk. Yeah. Um, Emma was saying maybe you study what they eat. Settler says that you they study you study what they eat. Christina was thinking maybe you study where they go, where they travel. And Rachel was wondering um, how old can they live to be? So maybe that's something that you study as well. And Nina says that you study their habits. So a lot of people are, are looking at eating, what they're eating. Um, and then some of them, some people are talking about behaviors. Those are all absolutely correct. And those are all great answers. We study where they are. We want to know how many there are. We want to know what, where, and how they're eating. We want to know how well they're surviving, how often they're having pups. And there's so much more that we can look into and research about these animals. So we're going to first start off talking about stellar sea lions. And then a little bit later, I'm going to talk about northern fur seals. So what you notice about this picture is that there is one gigantic stellar sea lion. And for those of you in Alaska, you might know exactly who this is. This is the large adult male stellar sea lion, and we call these bulls, as you can tell by their really big size. These smaller sea lions here, these are all adult females, and these small dark brown ones are the baby sea lions, or we call them pups. Now, you might be looking at this male and wondering how big he is. He is as big as a small car. So the next time you see a Fiat 500 or a Volkswagen Beetle, you can tell your friends that that car weighs as much as a stellar sea lion male. Stellar sea lion males get up to 2,400 pounds. And even though females are a little bit smaller than them, they still weigh up to 800 pounds. And the pups, when we go out to, into the field and we handle them, they're about three feet long and can be up to 100 pounds. So stellar sea lions are huge. And I have a really good example to show you. I have this really cool sea lion skull. This is a male stellar sea lion. You can see right here is his nose. This is his eye. This is where his eye would be. These are his teeth. Whoops, <laughs> this is tricky. Yeah. So I just wanted to show you in comparison to my head, this is a huge skull. But what we don't see is the lower jaw of the skull. So that would probably be around here. So stellar sea lions are really big. So one of the main things that we want to study for most populations is we want to know how many there are. Because once you know how many there are, you can tell if their population is going up or down over time. And one thing to think about in Alaska, which many of you know, Alaska state is huge. It's as big as the United States. And this southern coastline with all of these known stellar sea lion sites, which are those blue dots, that's the same distance as if I flew from Seattle to Florida. So I'm curious to hear if you guys have any ideas of how you think that we study animals that are over a huge geographic area like this. So how do you think that Katie and her co-workers study how many sea lions there are? Um, <laughs> I think a lot of people have been looking at your title, Katie, because many, many people are saying drones, drones. And Leah says planes, Jasper says drones, um, Christina, Emma, Leah, Texas. Yes, a lot of drones and airplanes answer. Exactly. So the main way that we study stellar sea lions is we use airplanes. So we have we work with the NOAA, NOAA Corps group and they fly the NOAA Twin Otter aircraft for us. And so with them, with the aircraft, we have two pilots, a mechanic, and then we have three scientific staff that are in the airplane. They're in the airplane controlling the camera mount. This is a three camera mount that we use to take pictures of sea lions that are on land as we fly over. One thing to consider is that since Alaska is so huge and the Aleutian Islands go out so far, out here it's quite remote and it can be pretty tricky to get a plane out there. So this is when we bring in the drones. But we have to find a way to get out there. And so the way that we do that is we go out on a research vessel. To go out to the Aleutians, we go out every year on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service research vessel, the Tekla. This offers us a great opportunity to get on a skiff, get closer to animals, and do all sorts of different research projects besides just collecting counts. That's right, we go and we get on shore and we pick up their poop. 
<laughs> now you might think this is really gross, but scat is very, very important so that we can figure out what sea lions are eating. When we collect the scat, we take it back to the lab. And once you wash off all the dirty bits, all you're left with are these clean, dry fish bones. From these fish bones, there are experts who can look at them and identify the species of fish that they're eating. They can even estimate how big those fish are. And then of course, we do our drone surveys. Oftentimes we get to a site that's just too big to be able to count accurately from the skiff or from shore. So we are able to use our drone to fly over and take pictures of sea lions hauled out on land, just like the big plane does. <laughs> And now I have another video to show you about drones. So while you're setting up that video, um, Katie, uh, there were a couple people who are wondering whether you... Sorry, I just pressed play. Oh, sorry, never mind. So Katie, I think you're muted again. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> I'll stop for questions after this slide too. Yeah. So we make sure when we go out and fly that we make sure we check the drone every time we, before we fly, we have to do calibrations, make sure the camera's working, make sure everything feels right. And then we're able to take off. As you can see from this video, the drone is super, super small and we have to fly it pretty high over the animals in order to reduce our disturbance of them. But for a drone this size, generally the animals may not even notice it. If they do notice it, it might be because they hear something, but they tend to not really react and stay hauled out on the beach. We have a ground control station, which you see here, and this gives us a view of what the camera is seeing, as well as telling us how much battery time is left how long we've been in the air, and how many satellites we're linked to. So I see that there's a bunch of questions here about drones, um, but um, one of the questions that came up just before we started the video was that Janet was wondering whether you count seals and sea lions with the help of citizen scientists. You know what? We don't help. We don't have citizen scientists help us with that. But we used to have citizen science scientists help us with a project called Stellar Watch on Zooniverse.org. Um, we no longer have that project going, but that pro that program has tons and tons of projects for people to go on and help. We do count our images manually. So it's me and one other biologist, and we have to go through and go dot by dot by dot and count every single individual sea lion on those images. And that can take up to four months long. So we've got a couple of questions. Um, Kaya was, or Nina was asking who controls the drone? I saw that you had the controls um, in front of you on the video. And then um, Joshua was asking, why does the drone have homemade floats on the bottom? <laughs> yes, those floats are um, really high tech pool noodles. <laughs> and that is so we can actually see, you'll notice that those two pool noodles are actually different colors. And that actually helps us with orientation. So if, if we go out and fly the drone and we have to move it around, we can always tell which side is the left side and which side is the right side, no matter how many times we get turned around. Right. And I'm sorry, and what Emily, was the other question that I answered? Oh, um, so uh, Nina was asking who controls the drone. Uh, yes, I, I'm one of the NOAA, I'm one of the UAS pilots or drone pilots, and we have a couple, we have several other pilots in our program as well. Um, Emma was wondering, have you ever lost any drones, like crashed them? <laughs> oh, Emma, yes, we have. <laughs> uh, it happens very, very rarely. Um, one time we actually had an incident on uh, Bogoslav Island, but it's because it is a volcano and there was so much volcanic interference that our compass just stopped working. And the drone, the wind was so high, it just blew it behind a hill. And so we, it ended up crashing. <laughs> that was a bummer. Um, yeah, that sounds like a real bummer. Um, Rachel was wondering, how do the drones survive in the water? So the drones are not waterproof. If they go in the water, they probably won't be working anymore. 
Um, the only thing that would really save them is if we, if the pilot somehow quick enough turned, turned it off and then was able to rinse it off and let it dry off really quickly, then it might be saved. But otherwise, these drones are not waterproof. Okay. And um, Pascal was wondering, couldn't you make a bot to count the seals? So I think that he was talking about when you're counting them one by one. And so maybe there's a computer program or something that could count them. You know what, that is a great point. And that is actually what we're trying to work on. We are trying to work with experts to use artificial intelligence or machine learning so that we can automate the counts of stellar sea lions. I'm hoping that in about a year, we'll have a program that we can use to automate that so we don't have to go dot by dot by dot. <laughs> <laughs> and then Christina was wondering, how long did you have to practice flying the drones before you get, became an expert at it? And I was wondering whether this might be a good time to show your little drone that you practiced on. Oh, yeah. That's a great. So point. maybe yeah. and maybe you could um, turn off your screen so so you could we can see you yeah bigger. Great. Yes, that's a great question. So we actually have to practice a lot for the drone, and what's really important is that we could keep practicing. It's important that we are always practicing so that we just maintain our experience because once you don't fly for a while, I get you get pretty rusty, and this is actually the tiny little drone that I've been practicing on lately because we haven't been able to go out and do any surveys. This is just a small little commercial off the shelf one that I bought off of Amazon. It costs about $26. And um, if you can fly this, you can definitely fly our big fancy drones. <laughs> um, Clara had also wanted to know, how are the images you get from the drones? Are they good quality? Our images are really good quality. It all depends on how high you fly though. So if you're flying over a species that you really don't wanna disturb and you're flying higher, the images might not be as high resolution or as crisp, but generally our images are really good. It just depends what camera you have too. And then um, Statler was asking, what does UAS pilot mean? I think that uh, he was wondering what UAS stand, stands for. Yeah, so UAS is the general term that we use for drones. UAS stands for Uncrewed Aircraft System. So I generally call them UAS, so I might say it once in a while when I mean to talk about drones with you guys. Okay, well, um, that's most of our question. There's a couple of questions that I think that you might get into a little bit later. So um, why don't we go ahead and then we'll see whether you'll answer those questions in the upcoming section. Great. All right, so now we're gonna switch gears and we're gonna talk about Northern fur seals. I wish you guys could all just smell what this picture would look like if you were there in person. I'm sure many of you in Alaska know exactly what fur seals smell like and sea lions. <laughs> so here, um, Northern fur seals go to two main areas in Alaska where they, in the summertime, to breed and to birth their pups. And that is the Pribilof Islands and Bogoslav Islands. I'm gonna talk a bit about the Pribilof Islands later, but I first wanna talk about Bogoslav Island, which is a pretty special island. This is what Bogoslav Island looked like in 2015, but it's actually a volcano. And after many, many eruptions, this is what Bog Bogoslav Island looks like now. So as you can see, it's gotten a lot bigger. It seems to be a little bit steamy. And here's another image. This is before in 2015, you can see grass, fur seals all along the beach, tons of seabirds. And then this is Bogoslav Island now from that same perspective in 2019. You can see it's rocky. There's lots of volcanic boulders, lots of steam and little puddles of water here and there. So the traditional way that we survey stellar, or sorry, the traditional way we survey fur seals is from the ground. So we wanted to go to Bogoslav Island so that we could go and assess and see how the fur seals are doing after all the eruptions happened. I have a very cool video for you. This is the research uh, or the research vessel Tekla that we go on. Every time we want to go to shore, we have to deploy the skiffs off the side of the boat. The skiffs are the, the red inflatable boat that you see right there. 
we have to make sure we stay a certain distance away from shore just so we don't hit the ground. <laughs> and then we have to load up all of our gear. That very heavy case right there is the drone that we fly. <laughs> As you can see, this can be pretty challenging if the weather isn't as being as nice as it is, as it is here. And then we can set off to go to shore. So as you can see, Bogoslav Island, even when we were there after it had erupted 52 times with the last eruption in 2017, it is still very steamy and very active. It looks a lot, it reminded me a lot of Yellowstone National Park, if anybody's been there, or if you've ever been to a hot spring. Um, nobody touched the water because it was probably too hot. We were all afraid to. We kept a really safe distance from the inside of the island, and we stayed mostly on the outside of the island, on the beaches. But the great thing about Bogoslav, even after all those eruptions, is that it is still absolutely covered in fur seals. In fact, the fur seals ended up increasing and there are more there than there were in 2015. So we spent about a week being on this island and we wanted to use our traditional method for estimating abundance or counting northern fur seals and we also wanted to do drone surveys so we could compare the two methods. So there you can see we're taking off with the drone and that's that this is our new drone that we have. This is that called the APH-28 and it's a hexacopter. It has six motors and six propellers, and it flies with two batteries, and it gives us about 20 minute flight time. I really like this hexacopter because it is really sturdy in high winds, and it can carry a really nice camera. And so there you can see I'm flying it with the controller. And we always have to make sure we keep our eyes on the hexacopter at all times. And there you can see Brian's looking at the ground control station so he can relay some information to me and directions on where I should fly. All right. So we have some questions about the, oh. the, oh, the drone that you that you have, if you have some time, a little bit of time for questions about the drone? Yes, please, absolutely. Okay, so um, <laughs> uh, Rachel was asking whether waterproof drones exist. There are actually, there is a waterproof drone and there are drones that are pretty water resistant. And that's because a lot of people end up flying these drones through whale snot. <laughs> So <laughs> scientists get to do a lot of really gross things. So when you when you fly a drone through uh, the blow of a whale, you get a lot of the snot and everything, and they're trying to collect that snot so they can do tests on it and see how healthy and make sure there's no diseases or anything in that whale. So, so there's definitely a need for some of those water resistant drones. But And when you make drones more waterproof though, you end up just making them heavier. So, um... We also had a question about that little tiny practice um, drone and Statler was wondering whether there is a camera on that drone because he wants one, but I was thinking it pretty small. So any camera would have to be very tiny on it. Yes, there actually is a little camera. You can see it right, oops, right here. And I don't, I don't actually have a, an SD card or a memory card in it. So I've never actually flown it with the camera. Um, but yeah, the, even the smallest ones can have cameras on them. And I just wanna show you too, this is the controller that we use for this drone. Oops. So it looks a lot like the controller that we have. We still have these two sticks. And we still have a little display that shows us information. Very cool. Um... Uh, Texas was wondering why was the top of the drone clear clear in the video? Yeah, so the top of the drone, it's important for it to be clear so that there can be so that it can receive GPS signals and it can um, maintain its orientation and compass orientation. So it's it, it's important for it not to be a solid mass on the top because that's where all the guts of the drone are and that's where all the signals need to go through. That's a good and question. That actually, that actually um, might 
might answer Brian's question. He was wondering why is the drone connected to satellites, but is that because of GPS or does it, um, is yeah. that other? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, we use satellites so that we can get our GPS position. So sometimes when we fly in Alaska, if we're flying somewhere at the base of a cliff, it can be kind of hard to get enough GPS satellites. So we sometimes we have to move around and go to the go to a good spot where we have good signal. So um, I had we had a couple of questions about Bogoslav Island. Um, let's see. Um, Megan was wondering whether when you visit if you live on the island or on the boat? So when we visited Bogoslav Island, we stayed on the boat the entire time, um, just because of the concern of it being an active volcano. <laughs> but every morning we would check in with the Alaska um, Volcano Observatory and they would let us know. They had special little instruments that were stationed on the island. So they could, they could monitor it for any seismic activity or any other volcanic activity. So we checked in with them every morning and they would give us the go ahead to get on shore. Before the eruption um, in 2015 and before that, when our scientists go out to Bogoslav Island, we used to actually have a cabin on the island that they would stay on and camp on. Um, Rachel had also wanted to know, does the steam from the volcano burn? The steam didn't burn, but it smelled a lot like sulfur. So it did not smell super great on that island. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then um, Alice and Paul were wondering, do you use an ROV to count animals under the water or do you, or oh. can you see the animals under the water when you're, when you are taking pictures with the drone? So when we take pictures with the drone, we can see animals if they're pretty close to the surface, but no, we don't actually use an ROV for anything, but that could be really interesting to understand how they forage better. One really cool project that my colleague Carrie Kuhn is doing is she's been able to put out camera tags on fur seals and see and actually take video of fur seals swimming and foraging and biting and getting fish and hunting their prey. So that's been a really, really cool experience. There's also another type of drone called the sail drone and that one surfs at the surface of the ocean. And what that one does is it goes around and collects oceanographic information. And it also has these acoustic machines, which means that it pings down noises and sound. So that can try to like figure out what is underneath it in that water column. Are there fish there? How many fish could there be? What species of fish is that? Um, so there's a lot of really cool uncrewed systems like that. Very neat. Yeah. Um, Emma was wondering that if you make, you were talking about making the drone waterproof and how that makes it heavier. She was wondering, does that may, mean that the remote gets bigger as well? Oh, no, that's a good question, though. Actually, that same remote I can use on three different size drones. Um, so it doesn't matter that it makes it heavier. But when you make a drone heavier, how that can be bad sometimes is that means you have less flight time. So the more weight you have to get up into the air, the less flight time you're going to have. Great. And then um, Emma was thinking back to where you were showing the plane that was that was um, taking pictures. Emma was wondering if you've ever been in that plane. And Janet was wondering how far out in the Aleutian chain do you survey? Oh, man, I've spent hundreds of hours in that plane <laughs> surveying stellar sea lions. That's how I start, first started off at NOAA as I was doing the aerial surveys until the drones came along. So I would spend every year in that plane and we have surveyed all the way out to Atu Island where we were able to go and stay on Shemya where Ericsson Air Force Base is or Elmendorf, Ericsson, whichever one is on Shemya, I can't remember now. Um, but you know, the, the hard thing about being out there on a plane is that the weather is so foggy. We like to go and survey stellar sea lions at the peak of their breeding season, which is also fog season. So that means that we don't have a lot of uh, uh, time to, in the air and we have to make sure we have other airfields that are opened up so we can fly. So the last time we went to Shemya in an airplane, we were stuck on that island for 18 days and we only got to do a survey on one day. So that was a huge inspiration to start looking for drones. <laughs> Very cool. 
Um, well, maybe we will go to the next section where you're talking about counting seals and then we'll handle any other questions after that. Great, thank you. So here I wanted to show you one of our amazing pictures that we collected from the drone. And this is on Bogosoft Island on one of the so, points. So Katie, I think you need to share your screen again. Oh, sorry about that. How's that? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Well, here's the picture now <laughs> um, Bogosoft Island. And what you'll see here is there are a lot of critters on this picture. And it might be kind of hard to tell. It might seem like there's a lot of different species, but there's actually only two species. And those are these blonde slash white slash light brown stellar sea lions, which are a little bit bigger. That's all these guys that I'm kind of circling in the red. And then all of these other smaller animals and these little groups, these are all fur seals, the so northern fur seals right here. And you'll notice that northern fur seals hang out in these little rookery herons. So like each one of these clusters, there's probably one male surrounded by dozens of adult females and pups. So there's one, two, three, four, five different structures there, harem structures. And then all of these mess of animals right here, these all just look like tiny little pups going in the water. So when you look at this picture, you probably, do you think that we could use this picture to survey and count northern fur seals? Can you guys say, give me a yes or a no? <laughs> so what do you guys think? Do you think that you could use a picture like this to survey northern fur seals or would it be more difficult, do you think? Um, Nolan is saying no, Texas doesn't think so either. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Rachel says, no, there's too many of them. But Clary says that yes, she thinks that you could. Yes. And Pascal says yes. Leah said so it's, it looks like it's pretty evenly split between no and yes. And I think that it depends on how easy people think that it would be to count seals maybe on this um, background. Yes, exactly. So I would say counting seal, fur seals on this picture would be very challenging because there are so many and there's so many in the water. But given that it's a nice, flat, sandy beach, it's actually a lot easier than what we would deal with on the Pribilof Islands. So commonly we are wondering, how can we use drones to survey northern fur seals? Because this is what we deal with in the Pribilof Islands. I don't know if you can tell, but this picture is rocky and has boulders and also has fur seals, which are really hard to distinguish from the background. I'm gonna just circle some of the fur seal pups here. Whoops, let me take off my laser pointer. Just so you can see how difficult it is to see some of these pups. Well, the way that we're trying to see if we can study fur seals is we already know we can't use the same camera we use for stellar sea lions because we just can't see the pups well enough. So we have to look into other camera options. One thing that we were looking into is a uh, thermal camera. Have, I don't know, maybe you guys have heard about thermal cameras, hopefully. Um, but thermal cameras are really cool because what they do is they pick up on the heat of an object. So when we have a visual image like this, we can actually see the fur seals pretty well in this picture because they're against grass. But we can see them so much better with the thermal camera. You can see each fur seal right here glows and is kind of a warmer color like a purple against this colder blue background and you can also see that their flippers are white hot almost because that's where they shunt all their blood they send if they're warm and it's a nice day like it was on this day they send all their blood to their flippers so they can kind of cool down so that's why their flippers look so much hotter than their body but thermal images don't really work really well either. So we're looking into other types of camera like a multispectral camera. And I'm hoping in about a year or two, I'm gonna be able to do another one of these NOAA Live seminars with you and give you a really cool update on how we can use drones to survey Northern fur seals. That's really cool. And, and uh, um, we've got a couple of questions about those cameras as well. So, um, Chris was wondering whether you did a course to learn how to use the thermal camera. 
I did not use a course to learn how to use the thermal camera. I had to do a lot of Google searches and asking people, asking the vendor or the person who made the camera. So it was um, definitely a challenge to learn about a new technology, but it was really fun. And then Carol was asking um, whether LIDAR would be an option to use to look at, at seals. That is such a great question. We do not use LIDAR to count seals just because I think without having that, um, without seeing the full picture and seeing the distinction, it, it might just look like another, we, you know, in the picture, it might just look like another bump, like a, like a log or like a rock or something like that. So we kind of need more information. And I think the one thing that we're also really thinking about is we want to see a camera that will make fur seals pop from the background because we want eventually we would just want computers to do all the work for us and do all the counts for us like we're trying to do for stellar sea lions. So the best way to do that is to have the greatest amount of contrast. So that's what Great. we're working on. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right. And so I just want to end on this slide that about what you can do to help in your community. I, I know that not everybody has a chance to go out and do field work or volunteer or go to Alaska or go out to the beach, but there's a lot of things that you can do just from your home. If you do live nearby a beach, you can participate in beach cleanups. This is really important because beaches are always washing up new litter and I go to some of the most remote areas in Alaska and I see so much litter out there and it can be kind of sad. Whenever possible, it's always nice to reduce your use of the plastics, like using a reusable water bottle or not using straws and things like that. Another idea which I really love is to go on zooniverse.org and they have all sorts of online citizen science projects. So you can go online and pick out any interest you have. If you're interested in acoustics, you can have a project for that. If you're interested in bath, there's a project for that too. So there's all sorts of projects there. Now I wanna ask you guys, what are some things that you think you can do in your community to help the environment? Okay, so if you can think of things that you can do in your communities to help um, clean up the environment or to help the, to help seals, um, just put it into the question box. We already have a couple of of uh, suggestions here. Christina says to conserve energy. Pascal said to recycle. Patricia says walk instead of drive. Um, Jasper says uh, recycling, recycling and composting. Emma says plant new trees. Christina says ride bikes instead of cars. Statler picks up trash on walks and turns off the light lights when he leaves a room. Um, yeah, a lot of people are saying pick up trash, reduce energy use, don't litter. Um, Robbie says use less plastic. Um, Nolan says use less fertilizer. Barb says mm -hmm. cut loops. I would say that's probably cut loops in plastic. I think yeah, um, Michelle right. says no car wash near the ocean. So a lot of different different ideas here. That's great. That's great. There's definitely not a shortage of ideas there. Well, thank you so much for sharing all those. I'd like to take some more time to answer some more questions if we have them, Lisa. Yes, um, actually, Clara, Nina and Nicole were wondering, can you describe a day in your life as a marine biologist? So, oh, man. Well, you know, in pandemic life, it means waking up in my house and then going down my hallway and sitting down at my desk here and working away at my computer. <laughs> but on a normal day in the field, if we're on a boat, we wake up, we have a delicious breakfast <laughs> and we get all our gear on if we're at a site. And then we get on the skiff, like you saw in that video and we'll visit a site We'll look through binoculars to try to find marked animals. We may get on land to pick up scat. Um, we may look for whales. And then once we're back in the boat, we'll just cruise on to the next site. And then we do the same thing all over again. It's a, it's a really lovely experience. <laughs> so Katie, you were saying get on all your gear. What gear do you wear when you get in the boat? 
Yes. So you may have seen in that video, and I forgot to mention this, that we all had really puffy jackets on or suits on, and those are actually flotation suits. So instead of just wearing one little skimpy um, life jacket in Alaska, we get to wear these really comfy onesies that help us <laughs> float in case we ever go and take, take a dip. So uh, yeah, we wear lots of flotation gear. We wear heavy duty rain gear pants because we're working a lot with animals and you saw what they leave on the beach. So it, they're pretty messy and can be kind of dirty. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also had, there was also a question about um, what your favorite, what your most favorite and least favorite part of doing field research is. Oh, my most favorite part, I would have to say, is flying drones, definitely. I love going out and flying drones. I love getting good data. The drones have been such a huge help, and the sea lions don't even mind them. I think my least favorite part is probably that I get seasick constantly. So when I go out on a research cruise, I'm generally feeling quite nauseous, but that only means I'm extra excited to get on the skiff and get off the boat and start to work. <laughs> so it's good in the end. Great. And Carol was wondering about, you know, you had said that you were checking in with the volcanologists um, before you would get, uh, so that you could get the clear, go ahead to go on to Bogoslav each day. Um, what office were you checking in with? Is there a place, is there a specific office in Alaska who, that studies um, volcanoes? There is. Um, there's the Alaska Volcano Observatory, and they have a whole great website where you can actually look up all sorts of different volcanoes. I don't know specifically the office that we were calling into, though, um, but I could find that out if necessary, if you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and um, and then Pascal was wondering, is your job ever scary? Uh, yeah, sometimes it can be kind of scary, you know, when you're out in the elements and it's cold and it's windy and it's rainy and you're trying to climb up a little bit, little rock to try to get on shore and you slip and you don't want to fall in the water. Sometimes there can be moments that get the adrenaline pumping, but uh, personally, I really I really like to live in that kind of world. So I really love to go do field work and, and feel that adrenaline rush. <laughs> um, there was also a question about, have you ever touched a sea lion or a seal? Yes, I have. I've been able to touch a sea lion and a fur seal as well. And they it's such a special experience. Not a lot of people get to do that. Um, I've I've been able to do that also at, at the Mystic Aquarium on the East Coast. I got to meet Astro and I got to meet their fur seals as well and touch them because we were doing some research with their animals. And uh, that was a very special experience to be near fur seals that aren't wild and are a little bit more tamed. <laughs> that must be a little unnerving as well if you're used to staying away from fur seals to have them come right up to you. Definitely. I was definitely sweating and feeling very uncomfortable the entire time, but it was it was very magical. <laughs> so Olivia and Falana were wondering, why is counting the seals and picking up the scat important? How does that help and what do you do with the information? Yes. So it's really important that we count the seals and sea lions so we know how many there are. It's important that we know how many there are now so we can see and keep surveying them year after year so we can see how their population is doing. Are they increasing? Are they decreasing? So it's really important to find that out. And also those numbers can be used a lot with statistics and modeling to figure out all sorts of different questions as well. The SCAT collection is really important because that is really the best way that we have to figure out what sea lions and fur seals are eating. If we can collect that SCAT from those animals, we can identify the fish species that they're eating from the bones left over, and we can even estimate the size of the fish that they're eating. Wow, really cool. So Chris was wondering, how did you train to fly drones? Did you just train on that little tiny drone that you showed us or did you have to go through a course? Yeah, I actually, I did have to take a training class. Um, and if you wanna be a drone pilot and you wanna fly for a business or for the government or for a university, you have to take the FAA, which is the Federal Aviation Administration. So that's the same organization that, that manages planes in the air. 
you have to go, go to them and take the remote pilot exam. And then I was able to train on the little Hudson uh, before I took a manufacturer training class. So the people who built our drone came out and taught us how to use it and fly it and how to troubleshoot it and whatnot. It takes a lot of time to learn how to fly a drone safely. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> so Alice and Paul were wondering, do you have to sanitize your gear between sites to keep from taking germs from one, one rookery or one colony to another? Yes, we do. We do wash all our gear off with soap and water when we come back. Um, it's a little less of a concern here than, say, in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, which are really remote and there can be a lot of invasive species. We, we don't have that problem so much on the, on the Aleutian Islands, but, um, but yeah, we make sure we clean all of our gear when we come in to keep it sanitary, but also because it's usually covered in sea lion poop. So it's kind of necessary <laughs> if you want to pack it back up. <laughs> <laughs> And, and we had a couple of questions about whether you do animal rescue or whether you've been asked to do tours, but maybe you could talk a little bit about the permits that are necessary to do research and that not oh. just anybody can go out to those places. Yes, yes. We have, we have special marine mammal permits that are very, very specific in what actions we can and cannot do around animals. Um, there's, there's really, you have to have your name in the permit or you have to be supervised by somebody whose name is in the permit. So, and these permits tell us how low we can fly over the animals. They tell us how many animals we're allowed to let go in the water before we need to stop flying over them. Um, you know, if we're doing anything that disturbs them, we need to make sure we record how many are going in the water. Um, it's all very, very regulated and it's all very, very specific. And um, as far as animal rescue goes, um, I don't believe that that you guys are involved in any of that. But I do know we have a speaker coming up next um, in the spring who will be talking about sea lion entanglement. And um, I believe that sometimes when sea lions are found stranded um, and they need rehabilitation, that NOAA, the NOAA Stranding Network works with organizations like uh, the Sea Life Center to rehabilitate animals and, and, and see whether they're able to get them released into the wild. And then along the West Coast, we also work with the Marine Mammal Center down in Sausalito to do the same. Yeah, and in so, Washington, we also have SR3, which is another, it's a relatively new group too that does a lot of animal rescue as well in Washington State. Great. So the last question, um, several people asked, do you know when you'll be able to go out again? Do you think you'll be able to do field research again this summer? And I think we are all facing that question and it's a big question mark. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see. I, we're not gonna do it unless we can do it safely for the scientists, for the animals, and especially for the communities. Um, we go to some really remote places, so we certainly are not gonna go anywhere where we are not allowed to go. Um, and when, when, if, we, if we do go, it's gonna be done in the most safe way. So I, I, I don't know if this summer will be a good chance for that, but hopefully if a vaccine comes through, we can definitely have a good field season in 2022 as well. Great. And then one last question. Um, Kaya was wondering, did you have to take any specific math courses to help with the counting? Oh. Well, I didn't have to do it for the counting specifically, but to get my in undergrad school, um, I did have to take certain amount, certain math classes to get my graduate, uh, sorry, to get my master, to get my major <laughs> and my bachelor of science degree. I had to take calculus and algebra and physics and chemistry and all sorts of science classes. Great. Well, thank you very much. It looks like we're right at the end of our time here, but thank you so much, Katie, for, for showing us all of this really cool work that you're doing and letting us know about drones. And, um, and thank you everybody for showing up to our webinar. Next week, we're going to have um, some of our partners from the St. Paul tribal government talking about the youth programs that they run on St. Paul Island, which is in the Pribilof Islands, the 
one of the locations that Katie was talking about today. So if you're interested in that, please tune in, tune in next week. And thank you, Katie, so much for, for talking with us. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, Emma. everybody, for tuning in and asking such great questions. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you, guys, and we'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>